I'd love for you to open your Bibles this morning to James chapter 1. James 1. When you talk about something coming from God to you through Christ, it's called the gift of God, a gift of God. And we've equated that to grace for several weeks, that the grace of God, a gift of God, comes from heaven, comes from God to you through Christ. Look at this, James 1.17. James 1.17, every good gift, he's even talking about grace, every good gift and every perfect gift, he's talking about grace and all the things of God are from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation, no shadow of turning. He says it's coming to you. Now, this gift comes from God through Christ to you. You need to recognize the grace of God. We talked about recognizing grace all the time. Now listen, have you been conscious of this? If things happen to you good, are you saying out of your mouth, that's the grace of God right there. That's the grace of God. That's the favor of God right there. I see the favor of God. You need to consciously let this come out of your mouth. Say it out of your mouth all the time. That's the grace of God right there. You need to speak it. Look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We need to see the grace of God and understand we're increasing in this kind of grace. Look at Luke chapter 2 and look at verse 57. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and the favor with God and man. This is what we're supposed to do. Increase, increase, increase. This is the growing grace of the Lord upon us. Jesus, it was reported, grew in grace, grew in grace. He grew in grace. John reported it. Look at John 1, chapter 16. John 1, 16. And of his fullness, we have all received grace for grace. We grew in grace. We've got grace for grace. Fullness of grace was given to us. The fullness in the fullness, in his fullness, we have received grace for grace. He has poured out in his fullness. People around you sometimes, where they're supposed to be full of grace, they're not full of grace. You ever met somebody that was full of something else besides grace? And you said, well, they're not full of grace. And you wonder, what is it they're full of? Well, I'll tell you, if you're not full of grace, you're probably full of yourself. Because there's no room for grace when you're full of yourself. Grace or yourself should be there. And here's what goes on. If you're full of yourself, you'll say stuff like this. Well, I should give them a piece of my mind. You know, Kenneth Copeland says it like this. You don't have a very big piece to give away. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's not much that can happen by giving away a piece of your mind. He said, I want you to be ready to be full of grace. Grow in the full of gra fullness of grace. This is what Jesus did. Grew in the fullness of grace. Now, 1 Peter 5 and verse 5, James chapter 4 and verse 6, and Proverbs 3, 34 says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. Now, who gets the grace? The humble. The humble. But if you're full of yourself, you're not being very humble. Because you have yourself instead of the Lord. It's not the grace of God. You're full of yourself. You're full of your own opinion. I'm helping somebody here. You're so full of your opinion, that always comes out. The opinion of the Lord should come out. Not just your thoughts, His thoughts. Not just your judgment, His judgment. We need to be full of the Lord because there should be no room for anything else but the Lord. If you're not full of God, there's no room for grace. If you're full of yourself, are you with me? The humble grow in grace. And since I talked about that, you should turn to 1 Peter 5 and verse 6. 1 Peter 5 and verse 6. Now, if the humble get grace, and they do, 1 Peter 5, verse 6, it says, Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And here's how you do it. Casting your care upon the Lord, for he cares for you. 
Now, the mighty hand of God can be upon you to resist you or can be upon you to exalt you. If he's resisting you, you are proving that you're proud. Resists the proud. He resists the proud. Now, here's something interesting. In the Weiss translation, it says it like this. Instead of God resisting the proud, it says that in a bunch of other translations. It says in the Weiss translation, God sets himself in battle array against the proud. He make, takes his mighty arm and says, you think you can do it without me? Watch this. And you have no structure or help from the Lord at all. And it goes on in verse 6 and it says this. How do we humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God? Casting your care upon the Lord. Casting your care is humility. So if casting your care is humility, what is carrying your care? Pride. Whoa. We should stop and say, wait a minute, if you're worried, you're anxious, you're concerned, you feel a little bit tension, you're carrying that care, you're saying, Lord, I know, I know, I know I should cast this care, but I'm going to handle this myself. So you worry and you fret, you lay up at night and you talk. Anybody ever, now don't raise your hand. <laughs> don't raise your hand. Anybody ever play that ping pong match in your head? Well, Lord, I'm going to give this to you. Wait a minute, it's your turn. Okay, so maybe I'm going to take it back. Okay, wait a minute, Lord, I'm going to cast this care to you. Okay, well, no, I'm going to take it back, Lord. Because you play that little ping pong match or that tennis match in your head all night. You go back and forth because you just won't leave it alone. And so you played that game and played that game and played that game. That's pride. And God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, to the humble. Now, pride people... Prideful people, I'm going to help you, worry. Somebody said, wait, wait a minute, just because I worry, lots of Americans worry. We're all worried. We all worry about something. No, that's prideful. Prideful is when you worry about it instead of trusting the Lord. Trusting the Lord is not worry. Worry has a motto. Worry has a motto. And it says it like this. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I? Come on now. <laughs> what am I going to do? What am I? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am? I, the emphasis is on I, not the emphasis is Lord. I'm going to cast this care on you, and I'm going to trust you, because the proud, the proud have a motto, and it's I, I, I got to take care of this. Look at Matthew chapter six, and verse twenty-four. Listen to me. You don't have anything without the grace of God. Cast your care upon the Lord. Matthew 6 and look at verse 24. Now, if I could teach you one thing today, I want you to listen carefully for the next few minutes. Listen carefully. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. No one can serve two masters. How many ever heard that sentence before? You heard it before? I guarantee you that in the next few minutes, I'm going to reveal something to you that's going to help you understand it even better than you ever have before. This is a really powerful statement, but we brush over it. We say things like, well, you can't serve God and mammon, and that's what it says. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon. Man money money. But it's not money alone. It's the worldly system. Money is the head of that. But mammon is anything in which we might trust in instead of God. So it's the worldly system. It's mammon. It's mammon. Now money's the center part of that because we put a lot of trust in money. We want to hope for money. We, we hang out for money. We do whatever we can for money. Some people go out of their way just to get money and more money and more money and more money. There's something to be said about having money because it's better than not having money. But you should trust the Lord for your money, not figure out how you're going to do it yourself. Now listen to me. Look at Matthew 6.25. You move down just one verse. Now this verse follows 24. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you now. Bible scholars, hang on. Does 25 follow 24? Okay, Bible scholars agree. Listen, 
25. Therefore I say unto you, do not worry about your life. Wow. Could God be any clearer? Could he be any plainer? Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about your life. Now here's what some people do. Do you wake up in the morning and say things like this? Ooh, what am I going to do today? How am I going to make a buck? I got I to gotta go make a buck. I got I to gotta hurry up and get, I got I to gotta get something together so I can go make a buck. If that's the first thing on your mind, you didn't cast your care on the Lord. You weren't thinking about, you were worried about the buck instead of thinking about the Lord. Are you with me? Now I'm going to help somebody. Continually saying, I got to go make a living. I got to go make a living. Now, there's nothing wrong with making a living. That's the part that God wants us to do, to give that to the Lord. The problem is when making the living has become your obsession instead of serving God. He will provide you a living. He's promised. All things are possible with God. But don't get yourself so caught up that you miss that. We need to wake up with the thought, I'm giving this day to the Lord. Not, how do I got to make more money? I got to make more money. I got to make more money. According to the word, if you take the word mammon, it's the passionate pursuit of money only. Wow. That brings a whole different realization. Now, here's the, here's the deal. Let me make a scenario for you the way that the Lord made it for me. You cannot serve two masters. So you say, well, God's on one side, and the constant pursuit of money is on the other. Okay. Well, let's look at it this way. Someone is in charge of you if they're your master. Someone, if you're going to do something, you need to ask your master. You can't just do it yourself. You can't just say, well, I'm going to go do this today. And the master say, no, you can't leave. Because the master must be in charge. Are you with me? You are in service to that master. You cannot serve God and any other master. Worry over your finances is a master. It's a master. And here's the example. God comes on your heart. Pastor's talking away, he's having a time, been touched by the Lord. He says, hey, we got this project the Lord's telling us to do. We got to do this. We got to save souls. We got to be involved. We got to gather $3,000. We need that money right now. And the Lord moves on to your heart and says, give a thousand. And you're like, ooh, praise God, give a thousand. Wait a minute. I need to ask my master. So you go over here and you go, money. It, I know this is not a good time. I know we're kind of stretched. But perhaps, if it's okay with you, I'm going to take $1,000 of my pursuit in this possibility, and I'm going to give it to the Lord. And money says, you know this is not a good time. You already, you already agreed this is not a good time. And you go, I know, I know. It says, you're going to take part of me and give me, a, you're going to need me. Don't you realize how much you need me? If you give me away, you won't have me because you're going to need me. And if you have less, you're going to want more. You're going to need me. And so instead of serving the master, you talk to your master and he says, this is not a good time. And you come back to the Lord and say, Lord, you know I'd love to do it, but this is not a good time. Because you're not serving the master, you're serving the master. I was helping somebody. When the Lord explained that to me, he said, you do it like that and people will get the picture real quick. Money has become a master. And it's focusing on what you can do and what you can't do, not necessarily for the Lord. You're about taking care of things for yourself and taking care of things. Be sure you have enough and more than enough and put something away. But if the Lord gives you an inspiration, says take care of that or help that. We've had times in our past when the Lord has ministered to someone and says, give that couple $1,000. Oh, we've had so much money come in from all kinds of sources God has provided. One in particular, one time in, one time in particular, we really needed some money. 
We were in the middle of a project. We needed some money. We told the Lord, Lord, would you take care of that? He said, I've already talked to somebody. It's already handled. We said, okay, well, praise God. And a week went by. And said, Lord, I know you've already taken care of that, but could you throw them up a little bit more? <laughs> I mean, I know they're on their way. And a second week went by. We're like, Lord, you know, what's going on? He said, I talked to them, and they decided not to do it. That's happened more than once. He said, well, I thought you talked to them. He said, yes, I specifically told them, but they decided not to do it, so I had to get somebody else to come and bring it. But I have to do it according to their faith. They're wanting to get blessed. They're saying, Lord, give me money. I'm giving them an opportunity to invest in the kingdom, and it will pour out blessing upon them. And they've asked for this. But if they won't give at the time when they're standing, they're ready to give when they know this is going to pour out blessing. And I've said this is going to be, I've told them, give this money. And they didn't do it. Then the blessings can't be poured down on them either and have to go to the next person that's praying and believing. We had one time in particular, similar scenario, went by a couple of weeks, came to the third week. We're like, Lord, Jesus... <laughs> Please, <laughs> stir these people up, do something. And these folks finally came over and brought us some money. And they said, you're going to have to forgive us. The Lord told us about three weeks ago to do this. Duh! <laughs> Just respond quickly when the Lord says it. Listen, when you need it, when do you need it? Come on, help me. You need it now. This is kind of how church work always is. It's not, let's wait till next year and take care of it. When the Lord says to do something, we got to respond. Are you with me? So this is the deal. We have to tell money, you know, I'm not going to deal with you right now. i got my master that's told me to do something. And we have to take control over that thing that's trying to become a master. And you say, I'm not going to do that. I'm giving to the master. And you turn around and reinvest in the way the Lord said, because he's trying to pour a blessing out on you in Jesus' name. Now, Matthew 6, 25. It says, Therefore I say unto you, do not worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, and about your body, what you're going to put on. Is life not more than food, and the body not more than clothing? I love this when it says, Therefore do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. In the Greek, it's emphatic. It doesn't say just, well, do not worry if it's okay with you. Let's not worry. If, if, if you can help yourself, try not to worry. It doesn't say that. You ready to hear what it says in the Greek? You ready for this? It says it like this. Stop it. <laughs> Stop. It's emphatic. Put a halt to it. Stop it. Stop worrying about your life. Stop worrying about what you're going to put on. Stop worrying about getting food on the table. And people say, wait a minute. Well, I can't stop worrying about getting food on my table. It's not a matter of worry. It's a matter of trust in the Lord. And you say, Lord, today I honor you. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. There's going to be enough food on my table. I believe that in Jesus' name. Amen. It's totally different. When Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah the head of the church, the anointed one, says not to do something, but you do it anyway. What's that called? Come on, help me. What's it called? It's called sin. When Jesus says to do something, or not to do something, but you do it anyway, it's called sin. Mm. And he said emphatically, do not worry. Stop it. Huh. There's a sin of worry. It's placed upon a lot of people's hearts. Matthew 6, 26, and it goes on and says like this. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor do they reap, nor do they gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Now here's the deal. Are you not of more value than they? Wow. He made it very clear. Which of you, by worrying about it, can change the situation? <laughs> now, here's what you do. You go to bed late at night, concerned about your money. You lay down on the bed. 
You wake up every hour, oh, I can't sleep, I can't even sleep. This is, oh, I'm so nervous, I can't make the money. I, we don't have enough food on the table, I don't know what I'm going to do. So you worry, you worry about it all night. You wake up every hour, every hour, and you're staying up about 30 minutes every time you wake up, so you're really having a bad sleep. You're sleeping about, you're supposed to have eight hours, you've had about four hours sleep, and it's been intermittent, and you've been worried and worried. Your body's in stress, and you've been worried about the food on the table, oh, worried about the food on the table. So you wake up in the morning, and you go in, and there's a buffet. <laughs> and you go, oh, look at there, the worry paid off. Anybody ever had that happen? No. No. It doesn't happen that way. I'm going to tell you why. Worry will not add one cubit to your stature, will not change one situation, will not move one circumstance, but trust in the Lord moves every time. Amen. 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 And it goes on and says this in verse 28. <laughs> <laughs> it says, so why worry about your clothes? Anybody ever worry about clothes? Oh, I know some people worried about clothes. What are we going to wear? What are we going to wear? But it's not like that. It's not like that. Some people are so worried about keeping up to date with their fashions. They go out every weekend and shop three to five hours every weekend. So they can just look at new fashion and buy new stuff. They got stuff in their closet that still has the tags on it. It's three years old, but it's still tagged. And they're moving it down the line so that perhaps someday they'll start wearing some of the stuff with tags on it. You say, people really live like that? They're called worried about what they're going to wear. So they keep moving stuff through their closet. In Matthew, 20, or Matthew 6, 28, Don't worry about your clothes. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Neither do they toil, nor do they spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? And then he goes on and says this, O oh, you of little faith. When you're worried, you're out of faith. When you're worried, you're out of faith. Has this ever happened in the Word before? Ooh, look with me. In Mark chapter 4. Are you enjoying yourself? Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 4, look at that. In verse 35, Mark 4, 35. On the same day, when the evening had come, he said unto them, Let us cross over to the other side. They were so excited. Ooh, they got all together. They got into the ship. And now when they had left the multitudes that were with them along the shore, there were some other little boats that went with them. And a great storm arose so that the waves beat upon the boat and it was filling up with water. But Jesus was asleep in the stern of the boat. He was asleep on a pillow. And they woke him and they said this to him, Teacher, don't you care? Don't you, ca don't you care? And wait a minute, I thought the Lord said, cast your care. It says that in Matthew, what did it say? Where, where was that? 1 Peter 5, 5, cast your care. Cast your care. But he wasn't casting, he was just trusting the Lord. He'd already cast his care. Where were these guys? They were in the middle of not casting their care. In fact, they said, don't you care? They were concerned about his love for them. Don't you love us? Don't you even love us? We're about to die here, and you're in the boat. You don't even care about us. What about us? You'll probably end up floating on the water, but what about us? We're about to die here. So Jesus arose, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Interesting to note that in this particular verse found right here, it says there was a great storm. Well, in opposition to that, Jesus produced a great calm. <laughs> and there was a great calm, and the wind ceased, and he said to them, Why are you so fearful? Why are you all worried? Oh, you that have no faith. When you have no faith, your worry takes off like crazy. Worry is not supposed to be there at all. It is nothing but prolonged fear. 
When worry comes in, faith leaves. You have to hang on to faith. When you hold on to faith, worry goes. Hold on to faith, worry goes. Amen. Amen. Don't worry about this. Great grace is poured out on the humble. Humble people quit worrying. If you worry, you're prideful. Come on now. Somebody write that down. <laughs> it's got to help you. A sign of the uh, of pride and the sign of the proud is lying around concerned about it. Anxious about it. Nervous about it. It's a sign of pride. Stop it. Great grace says, your grace is sufficient for me. If you're worried, you have no faith. If we want great grace, it requires great faith. You want more grace? It requires more faith. It requires the use of faith all the time. Any grace must be received by faith, and great grace is only received by great faith. Amen. Why are you so fearful? He said, why are you so fearful? Why do you not have faith? You have no faith. When you're fearful, you're faithless. You're full of fear, you have no faith. Fearful, you're faithless. The presence of fear and the absence of faith have one thing in common. One thing. The presence of fear and the absence of faith have one thing in common. No revelation of the fullness of the love of God. And you say, wait a minute. I'm, I'm trying to act in love here. You have no revelation of the fullness of the love of God. They came to him and said, don't you care? Don't you care? They did not have a revelation of how much God loved them. How much Jesus loved them. If they had that revelation, they would not have fear. Fear is the absence of faith. Is the absence of faith. Faith can be present where there is a revelation of the love of God. Look with me in 1 John 4, 18. 1 John 4, 18. In 1 John 4, 18, it says, There is no fear in love. There's no worry in love. There's no fear in love. If you want the cure to worry, you need to have a revelation of the love of God. Perfect love casts out fear. Now here's what you need to do. When worry tries to come on you, how do you get your faith more to work? You say like this, well, Lord, um, I'm trusting you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you, Lord. Uh, I'm going to put my trust in you. And all the time, fear is trying to creep in more. It's coming back and it's saying, but I thought you said you are going to get some money. Do you see any money? I don't see any money here. There's no money in your dresser. There's no money in your bank account. You don't have any money. What are you going to do? You don't have any money. There's no clothes here. You're out of clothes. You don't have any clothes. What are you going to do? You don't have any clothes. You don't have anything to eat. What's going to happen? You don't have anything to eat. Fear is relentless in trying to get you to worry. It will bombard you and hit you and hit you and hit you. How do you beat and cure worry? I'm going to give you a revelation. You ready for this? You need a revelation of the love of God. That means you've got to quote the word because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. Jesus said he came into this world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You say, Father. I know you love me. God so loved the world. He so loved me. He loves me. I know you love me. I cast my care on you because I know you love me. You love me so much. You're taking care of this situation. You love me so much. You got it all handled. I know you love me. I know you love me. You want to take care of my every need. I know you love me. I know you love me. You want me not to be concerned, not to be fretful, not to be concerned or worried. You love me so much. You love me in this revelation of this love, this perfect love casts out fear. So the love, the revelation of his love, you keep quoting how much he loves you and how much you love him. The Bible says you love me and here's how you prove it. Jesus says you keep my commandments. 
you prove you love me. And you say that over and over, Lord, I'm keeping your commandments, I'm proving I love you, and I know you love me. You love me so much, you sent your son. You, have a, you keep quoting that, and the revelation of that, and all of a sudden faith starts to arise. Because the quote's the word, and the word of God is powerful, and you're quoting that word, and faith comes by hearing, and you hear it, and all of a sudden it's perfected inside of you, it's matured inside of you, and it takes a hold of this fear and this worry, and it says, I about had it with you. And it knocks worry out of your life. When that kind of revelation comes, now listen, that's a whole bunch different than just saying, I'm going to trust the Lord. You get a revelation of the love of God, it'll eliminate fear from your thought life. Does that help anybody? This is a practical application of what to do when worry tries to attack you. You get, you hold on to, and you get completely in, in consumed with the love of God. It'll stop worry. I'll tell you what, that's a powerful word from God. Perfect love, and that's only the God kind of love. That's only when you're totally mature in His love. It casts out fear. It destroys, eliminates worry. Hallelujah. This may change somebody's life today. It casts out fear. Ephesians 2 and verse 4. Look at Ephesians 2 as we close. Did you get something from the Lord? That was a good, that's a good part right there. Hang on to that. Revelation of God. Ephesians 2 verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. Man, that's revelation right there. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sin, made us alive together with Christ. Now wait a minute. By grace... That's his love poured out on us. By grace are you saved through faith. Wow. This is the revelation we need to hang on to. He gave us the grace of God. It's the fullness of his love poured out on us even when I was a sinner. He poured his love out on me and there's no fear that can stay in my life because he loves me. He's there to help me. He's there to strengthen me. His love is sufficient. He's pouring out his love and perfect love casts out fear. I'll not have fear in my life because I have a revelation of the love of God. Amen. That should help you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you have ministered life to us even in this one thing. We receive the love of God and that perfect love helps us to stay humble. And this is where you pour out grace. Grace comes to the humble. And we receive more grace and more grace, insightful grace, grace of God, the favor of God. And no weapon formed against us can prosper in Jesus' name. I receive upon my life this day the fullness of God, the grace of God, the great grace, the all grace be on me and be on each person here today that we're filled with grace and filled with love and not worry. We will not worry. We stop it. And we give you praise for that. Now with heads bowed, eyes closed.